Hello, and welcome to your most obedient and humble servant. This is a women's history podcast where we feature 18th and early 19th century women's letters that don't get as much attention as we think they should. I'm your host, Catherine Garrett. This episode is part of our season on wit. And today, I am delighted to welcome Dr. Miriam Liebman, an assistant editor with the Adams Papers at Massachusetts Historical Society. Welcome to the podcast, Miriam. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting to be here. It's exciting to finally meet up. (laughs) Yes. I'm very happy to have someone from the Adams Papers. Our last Abigail Adams letter I spoke about with a good friend of mine, but who is not an expert on the Adamses, and we missed some very important points. So I'm very happy to have you on here as someone who's very familiar with these people and all of these large cast of characters that we can really dig into this one. So tell me a little bit about your work with the Adams Papers. What exactly do you do? What volumes have you worked on? I have been with the Adams Papers for a year and a half now, and I am the assistant editor primarily for Adams Family Correspondence our series on the private papers of the family. And it is the series that really focuses and shines and looks at the writings of the Adams women, Abigail, Nabby, Louisa Catherine. And it's one of the three series that we publish. We publish diaries. We have the public facing papers of the papers of John Adams. And then we have the family correspondence. I have now worked on several volumes in right just a short period of time. When I started, I worked on annotation for Adam Family Correspondence, Volume 16. Annotation is right, like those amazing footnotes at the bottom of the page. And it tells you who's who and what legislation they're talking about and what was that treaty and who was that visitor and what was that random newspaper article they were referring to. Really what got me through writing my dissertation. And it was such a cool experience to be on the other side writing those and like finding those pieces out and building out that world. I found when I first started working on annotation for the first time that I had been like kind of spoiled as a historian that the editors of the papers had already done a lot of that work for me when I was using published volumes. And then it's like, oh no, oh no, she just said like Miss Smith and there's like six million Miss Smiths. How can I find which one's the right one? Did you find it helpful in your your work? Learning how to annotate a letter is a, it's an art form and a skill. In many ways, like writing an 18th century letter, you learn how to be a concise writer. You learn how to choose your words so carefully. You also learn how to evaluate different sources too. As I like have said, it's my favorite things about being a historian is like very much in like the world of the Adamses. I get to be with primary sources. I get to read their letters. You get to build out the world that they lived in. But that's one of the coolest things to me is that sometimes you're looking at secondary sources and there's the big history beats, but you're looking at a letter that happened at a certain time and what was important to them at that certain time might have been forgotten like immediately afterwards. And you've really got to dig into those primary sources to be like, what's this actress's name and things like that. Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite things is to be like, let's look at a map of wherever they are, see the paths that they would take to really get on the ground. (laughs) See, if you're writing about Thomas Jefferson, though, he just wrote all that stuff down because he was insane. I do want to ask you, so you've been working with the family papers. Have you worked much with Abigail Adams' handwriting? Because I remember, and I wish I could find it, but I remember reading a footnote like forever ago that said that she had very difficult handwriting. It was one of those kind of like fun, snarky footnotes. Is that true? Or was that just like somebody writing a footnote in the 1940s and being mean because it was a woman writer? She actually does have notoriously difficult handwriting. We have guides to be like, this is the three versions of her R or three versions of her M. One of my favorite things that have been discovered over the years of reading Abigail's letters, I think at least three different versions of spelling asparagus. (laughs) I like that it comes up that often. Well, they were growing things. They are very much involved in gardening and spending time in nature is very important to them. I mean, asparagus is a hard word. I'll give her that one. So let's get into this letter. It's kind of a long letter. I want to make sure we have the context set up. So who wrote this letter? Who's it to? And what is going on in their lives at the time this letter was written? This letter, Abigail Adams wrote to her son, John Quincy Adams, on February 16th, 
1786. Abigail is in London, living in Grosvenor Square. She is there because her husband, John, is serving as the first minister plenipotentiary to the court of St. James. And this is a big deal because this is the first time the United States is sending a minister to the former mother country and are saying, we're equal to you. Treat us that way. And England said no. Yes, pretty much. It will take quite a few decades to work that out. So Abigail had been abroad since the spring, early summer, uh, 1784, when she finally decides that she's going to go to Europe, meet John Adams and John Quincy in Europe. They had been there during the war. And then John Adams was assigned to negotiate the definitive treaty of Paris, right, ending the war with Britain. And so they're first in Paris. And then in the early summer of 1785, they go to London because he is commissioned with this new position by the United States government. At this time, though, John Quincy Adams was back in the United States. He was in Cambridge to attend Harvard. He had spent quite a few years abroad, separated from his mother, right, with his father, sometimes separate from his father. It's the winter, and she is providing a very long update on what is happening because letters took a long time to travel. And so these letters, especially when there's an ocean between members of the family, are very long. Therefore, this letter is going to have a wide variety of topics within it, not always connected, some more frivolous than others. But maybe the main big family thing that's happening in this letter is um, Nabby Adams, John and Abigail's daughter, John Quincy's sister, is having some romantic issues. (laughs) I guess that's the way to put it. But there's so much more in the letter, ranging from politics to gossip to some great one lines. So I think the main context is just to know where the family's at and that This is a mother writing to her son and that there is an ocean between them. I did have one more question. How old is Abigail Adams and how old is John Quincy Adams at the time of this letter? Do you know? He is 19. He'll be 20 in July. Abigail Adams was born in 1744. She's 42. And now for the letter. Abigail Adams to John Quincy Adams. London, February 16th. 1786. My dear son, Captain Lyde is arrived to our no small joy and brought us a charming parcel of letters, amongst which I found one from each of my dear sons. You know how happy a circumstance of this kind always makes me. Two days before, we had heard of his arrival in the river and waited every hour with impatience for the letters. For those by young have not yet come to hand, he is still at Plymouth repairing his ship. Yesterday, we went to dine with a Mr. and Mrs. Blake, who came formerly from Carolina, but who have many years been settled in this country. Mr. Blake is said to be the richest citizen belonging to the southern state of Carolina. I am loath to mention that he owns 1,500 Negroes upon one plantation, as I cannot avoid considering it disgraceful to humanity. His annual income is said to amount to 1,500 sterling. He lives in a style of great elegance. It is not the fashion in this country to dine large parties. Few rooms are calculated for it. There were no ladies present except myself, your sister, Mrs. Blake, and daughter Mr. Bridgen, whom you know. Two young Carolinians, who have lately arrived and dined with us some time before. Your papa and Colonel Smith made the company. We passed our time very agreeably, but still the letters kept running in my head. About nine o'clock we returned home, and John Brizzler, who you know is never so happy as when he has any good news for me, opened the carriage door with a smiling countenance and an, oh ma'am, there are a thousand letters come. This quickened my pace, you may be sure. Well, says your papa as he was getting out, now I shall see your eyes glisten. Nobody ever enjoyed a letter more than you. During this discourse, Miss was fled and had mounted the stairs before I could get into the house, nor could the colonel keep pace with the nimble-footed Daphne. From that moment until half past twelve, we were all employed in reading our letters. Even the watchman cry of half past ten o'clock, which upon other nights puts your papa in motion for bed, 
passed unheeded by. So, a very sweet opening paragraph. I love how she kind of sets the stage. She sets the scene of where she is. Can you tell me a little bit about Abigail Adams and her views on slavery? Because the phrase, I cannot avoid considering it disgraceful to humanity, sort of jumped out at me as refreshingly blunt. Abigail is nothing but blunt. It's this paragraph that is one of the reasons that I chose this letter. And yes, Abigail Adams is often remembered for her opposition to slavery. However, while she was anti-slavery, she was not anti-racist. And that is something to remember and to keep in mind. I have a bunch of really interesting quotes to talk about this because it is so important, right? Something to remember is Abigail Adams, her father in his will emancipated Phoebe, their enslaved woman. So Abigail Adams grew up around slavery, right? In a household that enslaved people. And if you don't mind, I'll actually just use a couple of quotes because I think they're really helpful. In September of 1774, she writes to John Adams, quote, I wish most sincerely there was not a slave in the province. It always appeared a most iniquitous scheme to me. Fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering for those who have as good a right to freedom as we have, end quote. And then Abigail Adams to John Adams on 31 March 1776, which I think a lot of us know because it's also, remember the ladies. But she also wrote, quote, I have sometimes been ready to think that the passion for liberty cannot be equally strong in the breasts of those who have been accustomed to deprive their fellow creatures of theirs, end quote. In 1794, two decades later, a decade after this letter we're talking today, Abigail writes to John Adams on the 23rd of May, 1794, quote, yet having had a full view of Southern politics and Southern elections, I begin to think we are much the purest part of the union. Much as they hold Britain in disdain and abuse her constitution, they have adopted the most pernicious part in its most corrupted stage. So she talks about this throughout her life. And slavery was abolished in Massachusetts in 1783. So right about three years before this letter we're talking about today. And then in 1788, Massachusetts declares the slave trade illegal. This is the decade that Massachusetts has abolished slavery that Abigail, right, is writing this letter. When she's abroad in London, she goes to see a performance of Othello. And so she's writing to her sister in this letter, Elizabeth Smith Shaw, on 4 March 1786. Quote, perhaps it may be early prejudice, but I cannot separate the African color from the man, nor prevent that disgust and horror which filled my mind every time I saw him touch the gentle Desdemona. End quote. So we have to look at her anti-slavery lines and discussion and thoughtfulness and also not ignore the racism. Absolutely. Because she also has some interesting quotes about Sally Hemings when Sally Hemings arrives in Paris. So it's interesting that her politics on it were good. We've got to end slavery very soon. But her personal feelings, I would say, are racist. But when you read a lot of letters from this time, that seems it's more common than you would expect. It's ubiquitous in a lot of white people's writings. And I should say, these quotes come from letters and right, the letter we're talking about today are all available online for free on the Out of Papers digital edition on the Massachusetts Historical Society website. And it is an amazing resource. It's fabulous. I go there all the time. The other thing that struck out to me from this paragraph, this opening paragraph, is that she actually like quotes what people say. Like, oh, ma'am, there are a thousand letters come. And then she actually quotes John Adams. And he says, oh, now I shall see your eyes glisten. Nobody ever enjoyed a letter more than you. How cute is that? She does love letters. But letters were huge, right? They're your source of gossip. They're your source of information that's not from the newspaper. They're, they're going to fill you in on tons of information. Because if we're just seeing this letter of what she's writing to her son, imagine what she's receiving. and. Abigail was a master letter writer. She chose every word very carefully. We have drafts of their letters in the collections. For example, we'll note right differences in our annotation 
between the draft and then what's in the recipient's copy. And she also knew who she was writing to. So she would often play with who she was writing with, maybe lead on some information that she has, doesn't have. She's the letter writer influencer before Instagram. And hey, on topic for wit of like, she's not just writing a stream of consciousness here. Like she is planning and she is writing these letters. Yeah. And I think that is so underrated. She's describing the party. She's like, here are the people there. He's very rich. All of this. And all she's thinking about is where are those letters? Because she knows that the ship is there, that she should be getting them soon. I like that she set the scene. They're sitting there. They're all reading letters. They're excited. So the next paragraph. Let's go. Mr. S. amused himself, or tried to, with reading the newspapers. Yet I saw he watched my countenance at every letter. A little before twelve, the servant informed him that his carriage was at the door. He rose, and coming to me, placed himself in a pensive attitude then asked me if I would write by a vessel going this week to New York. I replied, yes, I will to my son. Will you, said he, with an expression which I easily read from his heart, will you remember me to him? I promised him I would. Know then, my dear son, that this gentleman is like to become your brother. I dare say you frequently heard honorable mention of him whilst you was in New York. His character is not only fair and unblemished, but in high reputation wherever he is known. Delicacy of sentiment and honor are the striking traits of his character. Perhaps Colonel Humphreys might be a little poetic when speaking of him. He said, It would take more proofs and arguments to convince him that Colonel S. could be guilty of a dishonorable action than any other man he ever knew in his life. What a contrast, some will say. But comparisons are odious. Let the memory of former attachments, since the recollection of them can only be attended with pain, sleep in oblivion. As they proved not to be founded upon a durable superstructure, they have properly vanished like the baseless fabric of a vision. Nor do I think even a wreck is left behind. You will say, is this not sudden? Rochefoucauld says, and Shakespeare makes the same observation, that a heart agitated with the remains of a former passion is most susceptible of a new one. But sitting this aside, you know the pensive sedateness which had long hung upon the brow of your sister. Loath, very loath was she to believe, and still more so to confess it, but at last fully convinced from the neglect with which she was treated, and the account of some friend, I know not whom, of the unsteadiness and dissipation of a certain gentleman, that he was unworthy her regard. She wrote him a letter very soon after we arrived here, expressive of her mind, though she did not at the time make it known to her friends. But she afterwards produced a copy of the letter, as a full proof that her conduct was the result of proper conviction and mature deliberation. The final dismission and the last letter she ever wrote him was in consequence of my expressing a doubt of his strict honor. It was then, as I think I before related to you, that she disclosed her mind fully upon the subject and asked advice of your papa, upon which he told her if she had sufficient reason to doubt his honor and veracity, he had rather follow her to the grave than see her united with him. I will not disguise to you that we had not been long removed to his house before I saw that the gentleman who made a part of the family was happier in sitting down and reading to the ladies, in walking, riding, or attending us to the theaters, than of any other company or amusement. Thus we went on for several weeks at a perfect distance. Perhaps it was assurances similar to those made to me, which might draw from her an explanation. This is a matter that I shall not be very likely to learn, but I perceived all at once upon a day a dejection dispelled, a brightness of countenance and a lightness of heart, and in the evening the gentleman asked permission to attend us to the theater where we were going with Colonel Humphreys. When we returned it was late, and Papa was gone to bed. As the gentleman was going, he asked a moment's audience of me, upon which he put into my hand with much emotion a bundle of papers and a letter, which he requested me to read and communicate to your Papa. The papers were votes of Congress and commissions, with the amplest testimonies from the generals under whom he had served of his brave and good conduct. The letter informed me, quote, that as the connection which appeared an insurmountable obstacle to the accomplishment of the wishes nearest his heart existed no longer, and from the opinion he had of the lady, he was persuaded that nothing dishonorable on her part could have occasioned its dissolution. He hoped that Mrs. Adams would not be surprised at his early anxiety to gain the confidence of her daughter and to lay a proper foundation for a future connection, provided it should meet with the approbation of her parents and friends, unquote. 
There were many other matters in the letter which were mention of his family situation, etc. I, according to request, communicated to your papa the papers and letters, as it appeared to him that this gentleman possessed all those qualifications necessary to make a faithful and agreeable companion, he left it wholly to your sister to determine for herself. I begged her to satisfy herself that she has no prepossession left in her mind and heart, and she assured me she never could be more determined. I think she must feel a calmness and serenity in her present connection, which she never before experienced. I am sure it has relieved my mind from a weight which has hung heavy upon it for more than two years. I rejoice that her conduct meets with the approbation of her friends. I doubt not, but her present choice will do so equally. I think she will herself communicate the matter to you. Okay. <laughs> so here we have, in great detail, the description. I, th I like how it just starts where she's like, by the way, Colonel Smith is really great. Also, he's going to bury your sister. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Nabby engaged to that Abigail is throwing so much shade at in this series of paragraphs? <laughs> Royal Tyler. Royal Tyler. The and he playwright. came up in the Mary Cranch episode that we did. Well, he lived, he boarded by the Cranches. And that's how he met Nabby. The ironic part about the amount of shade that she is throwing is that she loved him when he first started courting Nabby. This is from 23rd December, 1782. She wrote to John Adams that Royal Tyler had been, quote, rather negligent in pursuing his business in the way of his profession and dissipated two or three years of his life and too much of his fortune for to reflect upon with pleasure. But then, right, she goes on to be like, oh, he's changed his ways. And, quote, he cannot fail making a distinguished figure in his profession if he steadily pursues it. That was like 1782, I said. So it's going to change pretty quickly. Nabby's letters on this appear to be lost. There's not much. In a letter that's been dated 11 August 1785, Nabby requests from Royal Tyler the return of the miniature of her that he has. What happens is they're technically engaged and Abigail thinks the distance is good, right? Like a whole ocean. And there were rumors about Tyler that he had an illegitimate child and he got into trouble. The Mary Smith Cranch letter that we have is the illegitimate child one. And I was like, this is so great. This is such a hilarious description of this random guy. And I didn't know he had been engaged to Nabby. A very pivotal point in this letter. She made a good escape there. And also, I love that she's like, I would like my miniature back. <laughs> so Abigail is like so concerned about reputation here. So, so right. So William Stephen Smith was, was John Adams' secretary in London. And she's like, oh, you're interested. Okay, you need to go away for a little bit. So he goes to Prussia. And she's like, okay, Nabby. What's going on here? In that summer of 1785, writing to Mary Smith Cranch, Abigail relays a conversation she had with Nabby. And it goes, quote, a few days since something arose, which led her in conversation to ask me if I did not think a gentleman of her acquaintance, a man of honor. I replied, yes, a man of strict honor and wished I could say that of all her acquaintance, as she could not mistake my meaning, instead of being affected, as I apprehended, she said, a breach of honor in one party would not justify a want of it in the other. I thought this the very time to speak. I said if she was conscious of any want of honor on the part of the gentleman, I and every friend she had in the world would rejoice if she could liberate <laughs> herself. <laughs> and she, right, she does, right? And then William Stephen Smith comes back at the end of 1785 because Abigail didn't want it to look like she started courting with with one yes, person while yes. she's still engaged to the other right she needed she needed like that <laughs> alibi timeline right abigail is like pulling the strings here she's like oh this could look bad that she was engaged and then she abandons him for this other guy who's clearly better abigail obviously is very into him she's she likes she's writing wonderful things about william stephen smith he's like a man of honor she's quoting poems she's quoting colonel humphrey so i imagine wrote one of the letters that smith gave her what is your opinion on william stephen smith he does not live up to this honor. 
in the current volume of Adams Family Correspondence, volume 16, that we're working on, William Stephen Smith helps fund the Miranda expedition to Venezuela. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Basically, he tries to like incite insurrection in another country to overthrow that country's government. So he gets federally indicted and loses his job as the surveyor of the port of New York. His son goes, their eldest son, William Steuben Smith, goes on this expedition. And like, they don't know for a couple of months if he's alive. What strikes me a little bit about Abigail Adams is that she nailed picking a husband for herself. It's like one of my favorite relationships. And then it seems like she just keeps giving Nabby bad advice. She liked Royal Tyler at first. I might be reading too much into this. But when she's talking about how she spent two years worrying about this, like she spent two years agonizing over it, I think she's like, oh, I feel guilty that I pushed this Royal Tyler guy. I've got to fix the situation. And then she maybe rushed a little bit too much into the William Stephen Smith one. I think this is where we see Abigail's motherhood protection coming out, where she's worried about her daughter. One of my favorite quotes from John Adams about the whole Royal Tyler situation is he writes to Abigail and he says, because he's getting the impression that Royal Tyler is kind of charming, Abigail. He wrote, this is too serious a subject to equivocate about. I don't like this method of courting mothers. And then William Stephen Smith seems to be slightly courting the mom a little bit too. That's, again, very alien to modern romantic sensibilities would be to show up to your partner's mom's house and give her a stack of letters from your previous bosses. <laughs> What an interesting little moment. All right, last little bit. I do not know how to consent that you should give up your diary. It is the kind of letters which I love best of any. Your sister has been very closely writing ever since she received your letters. I am rejoiced to find that you are in no ways disappointed in the reception I promised you from your friends. Your sister Eliza, as you justly term her, is very dear to me, as you well know, and that my own children only are dearer to me than those of my sisters. Never was there a stronger affection than that which binds in a threefold cord your mama and her dear sisters. Heaven preserve us to each other for many years to come. Your papa has a vast deal of writing to do, and he sometimes groans and says but little comes of it. Yet I do know much essential service results from it, and much more might, were our country wise as they ought to be. I presume it will not be long before I hear from you at Cambridge. Watch over your brother, gain his confidence, be his friend as well as brother. Reverence yourself, and you will not go astray. Your friends give me most flattering accounts of you, and I give a ready credit to their word. May your honor, your integrity, and virtue always prove your safeguard. I fear Mr. King will think I intrude upon him by requesting him to frank this bulky letter. By Captain Lyde, I shall write to all my friends. Let your aunt know I have received her kind letters. Remember me to all my Haverhill friends, and cross the river present my congratulations. Love to my Tommy, and be assured you are all equally dear to your ever-affectionate mother, A.A. -A. There it is. A very long letter. It is a long letter. There's a lot in it. But oh, that is so sweet that she talks about never was there a stronger affection than that which binds your mama and her sisters. As someone who has a lot of sisters, I just, I love that. I know that you wrote your dissertation and your background work is about American women acting in diplomatic positions overseas. So how would you describe Abigail as a diplomat's wife? I give her the title of ambassadress because even though she doesn't have the title officially, she's doing it. She is managing a household. She is going to court. She is hosting dinners. She is paying visits. She is receiving visits. She is in the room where treaties are happening. At times, she's going to be the person who is transcribing a letter or endorsing a letter. She's definitely reading her husband's letters. So she has all of the intelligence and knowledge and intrigue. And John seeks her advice. So often the question becomes, okay, so like, was she good at it? Did she succeed? That's like a very old school diplomatic way of thinking about it. I'm actually less interested in like whether she was successful or not than the fact that she was a diplomat abroad on behalf of a very new country. 
she went into this completely like not knowing what she was going to get and like goes with it. It sounds like she's doing great. She's sort of understanding what's happening. And fascinatingly, she's not afraid to say what she has to say. And she's also aware of what she can and cannot say. And that's part of that drafting of letters. And she's aware that there are censors also. She's aware that her letters might be open. She has all of the skills of the diplomat. Whether or not a treaty comes out of it, I think is the less interesting part. And more about what are the skills she's using? Who is she talking to? What does she compliment the American government for? What does she drag the American government for? Who is she friends with in London and Paris? Who are the people that she gravitates towards? And then how does she like take those skills and like teach them to her kids? Yeah, her little advice to JQA, that is also very motherly where she's just like, everyone says you're great. Of course, I believe it. Your honor, integrity, virtue always prove your safeguard. She's setting him up to be a big deal. He's going to Harvard and she's telling him all of this political news, even if she hates talking about politics. And I don't know if she hates it. She has to say she hates it. She has to say she hates it. <laughs> That's part of it. When she has a line like be gone politics, she's doing a writing technique, playing with her reader. She's playing with a potential censor. She's playing with a potential unanticipated reader where she's saying like, no, like I'm, I, I'm not interested, but here's like some really good stuff. Okay, bye. And this is actually something that a lot of 18th century women who serve as these unofficial diplomats is like, this is what they do. They play with their reader. They play with their letter. They juxtapose fashion and politics and family as a way of covering what they're doing. That's fascinating. So to just sort of sum up, what do you think is the most significant thing about this letter? What do you want our listeners to sort of take away? from this letter. The first is that the Adams Papers has something for everybody. In this letter, you have gossip, you have a future Netflix show, you have royal intrigue, you have family politics, you have literature, right? There's Shakespeare, there's lots of quotes. You have fashion, you have ideas of masculinity, femininity, you have sibling relationships, you have parent-child relationships, and I think you can be interested in a wider range of topics and you will find something in the Anna's papers for you. The second is Abigail Adams had a ton going on. Like her world was big and not just John Adams' wife. She's not just the mom to John Quincy and Nabby and Charles Thomas. She has wide array of interests. She is incredibly articulate. And I think this is a letter that doesn't have maybe some of the big plot lines and storylines that we typically gravitate towards in the late 18th century and the 1780s, which is like such a fascinating decade and such a like important pivotal decade. And this like gives you a window into like what that was. As you say at the opening to this podcast, right? It's like, like this is like to tell the stories that like don't always make the history books. I think there's a ton in this letter that doesn't make the history books. It's a letter that is significant. It's a letter that we learn a ton from about the family, about politics, about international affairs, about gender. And it doesn't have a lot of big names. This is exactly how I feel about these letters. So I love having you on here. I love your passion for this. That is fabulous. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on the podcast. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me to my listeners, we've got a lot of quotes. I will do my best to try to put together places where you can find these quotes, but they are all available online with the fabulous Adams Family Papers and Adams Papers from the Massachusetts Historical Society website. Yeah, the Adams Papers Digital Edition. Adams Papers Digital Edition. So we will link to that. We will try to point you to the places you need to go to read this letter. And I am, as ever, your most obedient and humble servant. Your most obedient and humble servant is a production of R2 Studios at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. I'm Catherine Garrett, the creator and host of this podcast. Jeanette Patrick and Jim Embusky are the executive producers. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to listen to past episodes and check out more great podcasts from R2 Studios. We tell unexpected stories based on the latest research to connect listeners with the past. So head to r2studios.org to start listening. <laughs>